and uh, we'll be on our way. Great start. Now, I never had any problem getting this thing rolling. Now, here's what I'll tell you. If they sign the commission agreement, I'll sign the listing 75% of the time. 75% of the time. Y'all hear that? If they sign anything, I'll get the listing agreement signed three quarters of the time. Does that matter? Yes, ma'am. But uh, how can they trust you? You told them you're going to find a lot of buy sell their I said I'm going to try. So if you try to, like, next couple of weeks, why are you not? How can they trust you to this group here? How do you bridge, That's a bridge from yeah, the 3% buyer's agreement yeah. to them yes. signing a listing? Oh, it's very simple. It's about being truthful and helpful. The reality of what happens, a whole lot of you said it. A lot of you were saying they get frustrated, they get tired of trying. All they got to have is two or three times they booked an appointment with a potential buyer. They left work early, they went home, they cleaned up the house, and then the person never showed. For some of them, that happens a few times, and they're done. They're so mad, they're so, they're just done. Is this true? Yeah, so they're not all the same, but I'm telling you, the bulk of them will get over it. And if I've been honest, truthful, and helpful, even just for a couple of weeks, and they sign that commission, I'm telling you, they hire me. It's that simple. It's not complicated. Yes? No, no, it's, no, I'm not lying. Not, I don't ever lie. I don't lie to people. Week one, you better get the price right. What's week two? It's not, no, it's not, it's not just price, it's price and condition. You can get the price right, but if your condition is below the condition of all your competing properties, you're just gonna sell those houses. Is that true? So you gotta start monitoring for condition. So I'm gonna ask them about feedback. Have, have you had any showings this week? What was the feedback comment? Let me see if I can go online and look at the interiors of some of these other properties, talk to some of the agents and find out about condition. I'll help them find out about condition. I think y'all are overthinking this. What's week three? Traffic. If they haven't had 15 showings in three weeks, they're in trouble. And the issue is marketing. And that's where they're really going to start to discover, I might need an agent. Is that true? The one thing we bring that they simply find very hard to duplicate is traffic. Is that true? And I can't fix that. I can't fix that. I, I can tell them, well, here's what I think you need to do. You're going to need to go online and start spending some money on Facebook and Google Ads in order to get your, your property positioned in front of consumers. And it's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you money. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're in trouble. Because that's all you really have that's an option for you to get any kind of scalability to exposure of your house in the marketplace. Is that true? They can do it, but they got to know what they're doing and they got to spend some money. Is that true? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Uh, and then what's what's the next week? It's price, condition, marketing, and then what's next? Fourth week? No, price reduction. Price reduction. Right? If they've gotten the traffic up, if they've had 20 showings and no offers, it's almost always price. Yes or no? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, Y'all take a break. Be back in. Uh, Try, try to be back in 10 minutes. Try. Speed is the key. Uh, eight by eight. And that could be a touch a day for eight days or a touch an hour for eight hours. It depends on the nature of the work. That's exactly It says seen call mail. Uh, I believe it's seen the first. So if you're going after an expired, when you know everybody's calling them in the morning, if you go knock on their door, you're going to have a much better chance of winning that game than if you call them. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to do that or you can't do that, then at least drop off a package at their door. And when you call them, tell them you left a package at their door. People who are calling can easily be beat by people that are calling and they left a package at the door early that morning. So you need to understand a package. We're back talking about the package. Now what would the package be? It would be your pre-listing package for a seller with a different cover page. How to sell a home that didn't sell. And it would still be the same pre-listing package for a seller. Because how would a seller who didn't sell, sell? Hire you to do what you do as laid out in the material, right? So it just says how to sell a home that didn't sell. Uh, and
and then they would go through it. Now, my experience is when they get your pre-listing package, they have never seen anything like that from another agent, and the odds of you getting the opportunity go way, way up. Yes, ma'am? It feels like a lot of sellers um, secure a new agent before their expiration. Say that again? So it feels like a lot of like the sellers get discouraged with, uh, and they know their listing's about to expire. They start shopping for agents. <laughs> Like it'll get relisted like two days later after it expires. No, I said when you expire, it's a speed game. The eight by eight is a touch an hour yeah, for eight hours. It feels like a lot of sellers are, are setting themselves up with a new agent before their their listing expires. You mean they're already relisted? Yeah. Well, well then it shouldn't have popped up as an expire. No, I get what she's saying, but if they have not relisted your package before while they're still. Yes. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if the package is delivered that morning and they haven't relisted, your challenge is to make it compelling enough that they will question their decision. I see. Yeah, so if they haven't actually signed the listing yet, let's say the agent is coming over today and signed it, expired last night, but they ain't signed it yet, your package or you knocking on the door is your only shot you've got. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, my experience with it is a lot of them are frustrated, a lot of them are angry. Some of them will have picked their own new agent, but some of them are going to take a few days to kind of figure it out. A lot of them actually don't know exactly when it expires. I've door knocked on their doors and the sign's still up in the yard, and I know they probably don't know when it expires. Right? Because the agent and the owner are not talking. Because the agent doesn't want to talk to the seller because the seller is just only mad at them and they don't want to talk to them. Right? So they disconnected a long time ago. Yes. But, we, but as an agent, you can't approach the seller until it expires. So the way for them to find the seller is that they approach a separate, another agent and sell it. No, I understand that. But what we're saying is it popped up this morning on the expired report. I can contact them. It expired. We're not talking about going out, outside of that, that uh, boundary, right? You are allowed, you are actually under NAR's Code of Ethics, you're allowed to market to people in anticipation of a listing expiring, but you're not allowed to solicit the listing while it is listed. It's a technical issue, but it is actually a technical issue. Uh, it, it's a very gray area difference, but you are allowed to market to a seller for an interview when it expires, but you're not allowed to solicit the listing while it's listed. I, I told you it's a gray area, it's a technical point, but it is it is a point. I'm not telling you to do anything about that, I'm just telling you a, a reality. I mean, think about it, if a seller hasn't sold, wouldn't it be harming the consumer to say they can't get any information about who you should hire until it's actually off the market? That's harming the seller. Yes? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm well aware of that, but I'm saying they don't know who to call necessarily. They don't know who to call. All right. Home life is marketing to that, yes? Home life, right? They are marketing specifically to that issue. We know who you should call, all right? All right. Uh, yeah, geographic farms. This is a biggie. People that live in homes often buy and sell homes and those homes are in neighborhoods yes <laughs> this is real estate 101 baby <laughs> so what do we know about neighborhoods they have turnover rates and they are historic meaning they're typically not all over the map they typically have a trend line and why does a neighborhood have a trend line because neighborhoods have life cycles the, the highest D turnover rate of a neighborhood, quote unquote, is, and I'm talking about something that was built, all of it, 400, 500 homes, you may not have that here or not, but in terms of conceptually, if a neighborhood gets built, the highest D transfer rate will be in the first two decades of that neighborhood's experience. 30 to 40 years after that neighborhood got created, the turnover rate is slowing. When you, when you hit 40 to 60 years since the subdivision got built, the turnover rate is falling. There, 
there are the fewest homes sold in those 20 years than uh, any of the other 20 years. What's happening to the neighborhood? It's getting older, and there are three kinds of people who buy houses. There are people that move a lot, there are people who move less, and there are people who don't move. So over, over 40 years, who's, every time a home is sold, one out of three that move in don't move. Do y'all follow that? So over time, what happens? 40, 50 years, the Joshua's will live there 10 years, the Moses will live there 27 years, the, right? Everybody's talking about, yeah, we all lived there a long time. What's happened to the neighborhood? Well, no, but what's happened to the neighborhood? It's getting run down because nobody cares. They're not moving. I mean, my father, we got my parents. They lived in one home for a long time, 62 years, one home. And we got to move out because their home was a three-level home, which as you're in your late 80s, that's a death trap, right? So we got them to move. We built a home for them that was flat. Even the garage into the kitchen was flat. You can't tell it unless you look, but it's very friendly to elderly or you know handicapped people. Very friendly. There are handholds and recesses just kind of built into walls and places that they just look like a decorative thing, but that's what they are. So anyway, when they when they sold the home, uh, the Owens. I grew up in that home. The Owens lived across the street. They were still living there. The McDonald's lived across the street that way. They were still living there. The Armstrongs had just moved out uh, when we sold their home. We sold their home in the height of the market in 06 in the spring. The height of the market. My dad paid 11,500 bucks for his home on the on the GI Bill after World War II. 11,500 dollars. Yeah. Yeah, 2,200 foot, all brick, two huge oak trees, one out in the front yard, one in the backyard for shade, corner lot, three quarters of an acre. Nice house, solid house, hardwood floors, ceramic tile, backsplashes, floors, a nice, nice, solid house. Not fancy, just a really nice, solid house, right? Heart pine framing timber. Do you know what heart pine framing timber is? When heart pine is cured, you can't nail into it. It's like a rock. It's full of sap, which over time turns hard. It's just like a rock. Termites can't eat it. They eat everything else by God, but they can't eat hard pine. So anyway, we sold their house, and uh, my dad was looking at the, at the check at the closing table. And of course, he fought me when the offer came in. Remember, it was the height of the market. We got an offer right away. And it was over list price. And I said, we have an offer. I'm coming over, and you're going to sign it. So he's looking and going, Y'all appreciate it, it's so classic. You sure we can't get more? <laughs> <laughs> I, tell you, I, tell, I told him, I said, you know, just remember this, I have your power of attorney, you sign it or I'm signing it. Let's get signed today. I'm in it, not who signed it. Uh, so he sold it, and within two years, Ms. Owens was gone, the McDonald's were gone, the Armstrong's had already left, and the person who bought my father's house and paid top dollar for it, leveled it, leveled it, and built the McMansion. Mrs. Owen's lot was a, they had a nice house straddling two lots. The, the, the builder, or the buyer, leveled that and built two McMansions on it. So when I drive down that street now, that neighborhood looks nothing like what it looked like. And that had gone through the rise after World War II, and then the plateau, and then the slow fade, and once my parents' house got demolished, the neighborhood exploded and it got reborn. And that is the cycle of neighborhoods. They have a birth, they have a, a, a maturity, and then they have a decline, and then they get reborn. And it's typically between 60 to 100 years that that goes on. There's a lot of variables, but it's usually 60 to 100 years that that goes on. But on the back end, they're all accumulating people. All right. So. If you look at the farm, you want to find out what the turnover rate is. Now, the ideal turnover rate is 6%. 6% turnover. If you look at the neighborhood, if it's got 500 homes at 6%, 6%, that would be 30 cell a year. Your goal, in terms of the numbers we've talked about, is 2% capture. And the 2% is up to 500, so your goal is to get 10 a year. 30 cell a year, does it make sense you could get 10 if 30 cell a year? Yes, you absolutely can. 
The reason six is important is because 6% uh, actually is optimal opportunity, meaning there's something called um, uh, domination. And the principle of domination says one third of sales. If you get one third of sales in a typical geographic area, you are dominating. One third of 30 is 10. So if you went below 6%, you wouldn't get 10. Y'all follow that? And, and yet I want to go in where I can truly dominate because I'll be the maximum money I can get. Does that make sense? Okay. The, uh, the, the two percent is your capture rate. Remember we showed you that for strangers, MREA1 and MREA2, it didn't change. They called it one in 50 and I'm calling it 2% because it's easier to do math, right? Somebody else had their hand up? Yeah. Why does it say 8% up there? Yeah. Well, it says a minimum of 8%, but in the current market we're in, it's 6%. If you have declining sales, do you need to make adjustments? Yes, 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 yes. Any other questions? Yes. So, what is the math formula? If I take a specific town, not, you know, 5,000 houses or whatever, like, what is the formula for actually making that? Well, the formula, this is, this is the strategy for a neighborhood. So, now you can carve out a neighborhood out of, you know, a couple of different streets that aren't a formal neighborhood, but they're all similar kinds of housing, similar price ranges. But it is important you have contiguous kinds of opportunities, meaning they make sense because you're you're attracting different markets that you might not want to attract if you're marketing all kinds of products. Well, our neighborhoods are pretty much changed. We have a very expensive house, that's not because you start to buy it after the facts. We have a 1920s house next to a new mansion. It's a little different than the rest of the country, but. No, there's lots of the country that looks like that. But we have towns. Yeah, I get it. You're still going to have to say, okay, this area I want to work in. This area. And if it includes a variety of properties, so be it. But you, you declare the area, and then you need to get the tax office or the MLS has the tools. And some MLSs have the tool, but the tool still needs to go from the MLS into the tax records. Because I want to know about all sales, not just MLS sales. That includes FISBO sales, that includes courthouse step sales. I want to buy all sold property. Does that make sense? So you define how many deeds exist. By the way, command does this. You'll be able to go in command and take a map and circle it. Just use your cursor and identify, I want to go down this street and over here and over here and over here, and then go enter. And it'll tell you immediately 117 deeds. And then you'll be able to go in and pull out the deed transfers. So find out the rate of selling year by year. You need to go back at least three years because you want to see the trend line. Right? So if I look back three years, either sales are going down, sales are going up, or sales are flat. And that could reflect this 60-year cycle. So if you think sales are going down, and that's just going to be temporary, uh, that could go on for the next 15 years. Y'all follow that? So you, you don't ignore these trend lines. Right? You pay attention to them. Um, going up is desirable, but most flat is okay. But going down, I'd, I'd investigate that. You get more sales or trends towards um, the train, the commuters, and stuff like that. Yeah. Access. I know a lot of bedroom community stuff coming out of Manhattan because the prices are so high. And coming down is just too. Right? Okay. So. Uh, all right, let's finish this. So if you look at what you're trying to get, the 12 direct is the mail campaign. 12 direct would be every month, 500 homes, that's 6,000 mailers. At 50 cents each, that's 3,000 bucks. Now that's the mail. Do you pick the farm? You say yes. We don't have farm police, okay? Do you pick the farm? So one strategy, and I get what you're saying, but here's the point I was getting at. One main strategy of geographic farming is that the farm is at or above the average price you currently sell at. Because one way to grow your income is to sell more units at the same price. That would be straight line income increases. But another way is to sell more units, but the new units are at a higher price. That bell curves up your income. And that's what everybody should be trying to do is bell curve up your income. There is a, uh, 
a maximum utility to that, and that means this. Now I'm backing up on pages. Everybody should understand your market looks like this. That's the cheapest house sold all year. This is the most expensive house sold all year. There's one of those, one of those. This is dollars, and this is units. There'll be a bell curve. This won't be mathematically accurate, but you'll get the idea. There'll be a bell curve that'll look like this. And this is halfway in the unit. And then there's a quarter there and a quarter there. There is a trajectory to this bell curve. And here, it breaks hard down. Your goal as a professional agent, and by the way, we got a, a, a lot of new agents here, and new agents either think they have to or are told to start in this quadrant, and there's actually more opportunity here than there is here. There's more chances at bat here than there is over here. And in the, in the country today, over here, you're battling with not only first-time buyers, but investors over scarce properties. Is that true? Mm -hmm. So it's ugly over here. So you need to move over to here at least if you're a new agent. But understand there's just as many opportunities over here as there is here, just as many. And here there's three times the income. Your goal long-term as an agent is to dominate your business over here where you make the most money with the most opportunities before the opportunities start to collapse. And here's what you need to understand about this. This bell curve never changes its shape. So what happens in a, in a, a, a recession, a shift? What happens? What happens to price? They fall. What happens to units? They fall. So this simply shrinks or grows with shifts up or down. So if you park yourself right here, you're always where there's the most opportunity at the highest price before volume falls. Our farm area I mentioned, it's 1,300 homes, and we have been farming them 18 years straight. You know why? Because they're always at the highest price before the volume falls. I'll never back out of it. Huh? No, we actually get a little better than that. We hover around 3%. We usually get about 40 sales a year because we do what other people won't do. If if a typical agent says, I farm an area, or if I dig, all they do is send out a postcard once a month. That's like the lowest level of farming you could possibly do. Um, if you're going to do it at a high level and you get these right, you also look at the, um, uh, the sales rate, the um, uh, list to sales price ratio. So if I'm going to go take a listing and I know that, what do we say, 30? 30 sell a year? 30 sell a year, I can get a listing, that sounds pretty good, but suppose I look and there are currently 40 homes listed. I don't want a listing there. They got over a year supply right now. Y'all follow that? So you look at that also. So there's the sales rate, which is what the 6% is, and then there's the sales ratio, and the ratio is how many are gonna get absorbed and how many are available. And you want that to be 0.25 or less, because that means there's only a 90 day supply or less. And I want to see 90 day supply or less if I'm going to go in there, right? So what should you do to really dominate with a farm? If you're going to go farm somewhere, you should get your real estate report card or your real estate newsletter, whichever one you're going to do, get it built, print the first one and hand deliver it with a door knocking campaign and introduce yourself as a neighborhood real estate expert and create four points of value, five points of value, you come up with it. It matters that I am your neighborhood expert and I have four points of value that I'm gonna to deliver to you because I'm your neighborhood expert. Other agents may be sending you mail, nobody's delivering these four points of value to you. So then you knock on the door, introduce yourself as a neighborhood real estate expert, explain the four points of value, and you show them this is the real estate report card that you will get every 30 days and here's how it works. Explain it in detail, show them where the website is where they can go and find out what their home is worth and other information about buying or selling real estate. And then leave them with that and say, I'm gonna come back around again in the next 30 to 45 days to make sure you're getting the mail and if you have any further questions. Now, from that point on, you should door knock every month for three months and after that, you should have listings and when you, or buyers, you might have a buyer who buys in there 
then you need to start door knocking around that listing you, you are selling or sold or the home that your buyer bought, you door knock. Y'all hear that? So you never stop door knocking. Uh, my concept about door knocking shifted after a lot of years of knocking on doors. We realized, you know what? Wouldn't it be great if all the people in the neighborhood would just line up in a line and let us say hello to them one by one? Just next, come on down here. Hey, how you doing? Next, come on, move down. And I realized we have main subdivision entrances to this farm. So I started standing at the subdivision in the morning when they're going to work and just waving at everybody. Hey, how you doing? I'm Gene Rivers, neighborhood real estate expert. Light screen, go. Hey, how you doing? Not kidding. Stay in there and wave at them. Uh, we go to all of the homeowner association meetings, all of them. Uh, my wife had gone for years and they started asking her questions, just kind of ad hoc every now and then about real estate. Oh, Rebecca's here. Rebecca, could you answer a question? You know, blah, blah, blah. And then they finally asked my wife to be the official, give a real estate report at every HOA meeting. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. Now, how do you get that? You show up. That was after about four or five years of being at every HOA meeting and missing very, very few. Y'all get that? You, you, it's work. If you want to dominate in a neighborhood, the number one issue is be present and your mindset should be, I want to meet every single neighbor. If that's your mindset, you can become truly dominant. If that's not your mindset, I can, I can knock you off. I can just knock you off. I've had uh, spies in the farm ever since we started farming. Spies are deliberate, meaning you give them a paper bag and you tell them anything you get in the mail about real estate, anything, just throw it in this bag, put it in the back closet somewhere, and I'll come around and pick that up once a year and I'll give you a gift card for dinner at Ruth Chris Steakhouse if you do this for me for a year. Now we have 12 of them, 12 spies. That means every 30 days I'm picking up a bag and if somebody launches a campaign, I see it start, and I'll watch it. And if in three or four months, I think they have a legitimate campaign that they're building, then we're gonna counterattack. And we're gonna counterattack really hard, really hard. It's summer, if they were doing that, we've done this before, we got attacked once in the spring and in the summer. We got flatbed trucks loaded with watermelons, and we drove down the street with the whole team. We had 10 people on one side, 10 on the other, we were giving away watermelons door to door and thanking people for their support of our business. Two months later, the mail stopped. <laughs> I mean, if you know I'm willing to do this way more than you are, I'm going to beat you, and you know it. And you're, you're foolish to think postcards are going to beat me going door to door and giving away watermelons. All right? <laughs> It's the South. I don't know what you give away here. What, caviar? <laughs> Some beluga just for you, darling. <laughs> Any questions about farming? Um, yes. I don't know how it is where you're at, but from here it seems like there are a lot of us. <laughs> and so how do you do it when you're not competing with maybe a few, but you're competing with a thousand? If you think the, yeah, if you think the geographic water. farm is already too heavily saturated, then I would work a demographic farm. Demographic farms are just as powerful as, as uh, geographic farms, but it's much harder to predict the average price. And that's why geographic farming is so powerful, because I can look at, at, at a geography and come up with a totality of average sales price, so I, again, I can drive my price up, right? So if you were gonna work a demographic farm like nurses or doctors or lawyers, I've done a lot of demographic farming, and I will tell you, you might think, oh, doctors are all buying fancy stuff. No, there's actually a lot of them that have financial trouble due to their college loan debt, and they rent. I have two doctors that rent from me right now who came from up here, New York City, and they're renting from me. I have some high-end rental units, and I, I get 30000 a year from one, and I get 28000 a year from another one. Two doctors are renting from me because there's no higher-end rental units in my market area. I, I discovered this not because I'm brilliant, because we were building these homes in 05 in the height of the market, and when they were finished in 06, they weren't worth what I was asking. <laughs> so, 
I ran into, and I discovered this hidden opportunity that I didn't know existed for high-end rentals in my marketplace. And uh, these two doctors, and I'm telling the story, these two doctors, one came down to be a professor at the Florida State University School of Medicine, and this, the, the other one came down uh, to join a practice down there, and both of them rent because their college debt is still too high. And these are very accomplished people professionally, but the college debt is just ginormous. It's just ginormous. It's ugly. Okay. Uh, all right, let's move on here. What time is it? The graph. The next page. Right in here, you want to focus your business over here. In the third quartile, right before the trajectory on the bell curve arc goes down sharply. What? This is this is the market area. Yeah, this is yeah this this is just a market overall. Okay. All right. So uh, yeah. All right. Let's talk about the web now. You all know the technology revolution is happening in KW. Yes. So there's a bunch of this stuff I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking on because you all need to be diving deep into what's happening online with command and the consumer sites and the app and all this stuff. So it will be redundant. The main concepts, though, are very, very much unchanged, and you need to understand them. Typically speaking, in the old world, uh, you were told to get four websites. You wanted a mother site, a seller site, a buyer site, and a niche site, and I've had all of those for a long time, and we're about ready to get out of all of them. The consumer sites out of command mean I can get rid of all of those. You don't need any other sites. You just need your command consumer site. Why? We already discussed this this morning. It'll become the site that they want. So if they're thinking about selling, the minute they type in, I want the pre-listing package for seller, or even simpler, is what they do on Zillow. Find out what your home is worth. The minute they put that in there, it starts changing. The buttons will modify what they're offering to this person because now they've identified as a seller. Did y'all get that? So it becomes the seller side. It will become the buyer side. If they want to see everything, it can become everything. Show me everything. Everything. And it's going to be watching them. And remember them when they come back. Meaning what? They'll create more and more utility. It'll offer exactly what they want. The more they use it, the more it'll become the site that they want it. And this is the site they won't want to leave because it's exactly what I want. They're going to build it. Y'all understand this. And what do you have to do to make all this happen? Nothing. 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 Yes, you got to be a right? Uh, so none of that matters anymore. If you look at the deep dive on this, uh, yeah, uh, social media. Social media is itself undergoing a tremendous amount of change. Uh, we don't know where the privacy issues and uh, related stuff uh, statutorily is going to land up with social media, specifically Facebook. Facebook is in the firing zone. Facebook, for most agents today, if you were to look at doing pay-per-click campaigns or SEO or social media ads, Facebook is still, we do quite a bit of Facebook advertising for our websites, and it's still the best bang for the buck, although it is down from the, from the best it's ever been with us. It is down, but it's still cost-effective. Uh, we're doing about equal money on uh, Google as we are on Facebook and the return we get is fine. It's not the best it's ever been, but it's fine. Uh, video, you better pay attention to. Big time pay attention to video. We'll talk about that in a second. This graph right here explains the game of internet lead generation, and it's exactly on point about today. And I'm gonna start at the end. It says the end game is active buyers and sellers that comes from lead conversion, that comes from lead capture, which is best done on your website. Lead capture is best done on your website. So if you look at the outer circle, you can drive people to your website with offline marketing, 
with search engine marketing or SEO campaigns. You can do it with listing aggregators, in other words, you're on other sites that are promoting you, or you can do it with online marketing, which would be Facebook. You can do social media marketing for the online marketing. If you look at the specific social media sites, blogging, in today's world, if you're considering cranking up a blog, I think that can actually work for you, but I think you might look at podcasting. The, the, the explosive growth in podcasting requires you to look at that before you dive into Because either one is only going to work if you constantly create content. Is that true? So if, if you're going to spend the same amount of time, I'd look at podcasting maybe as a better vehicle than, than blogging. Um, media sharing. What's media sharing? Oh, come on. Instagram. YouTube. Instagram. And those are the two biggies. YouTube and Instagram. Uh, who has the most eyeballs on the internet? Google. Google. Google has the most eyeballs on the internet. Who's next? Facebook. Facebook. So Google bought who? Social media. Who? Google owns YouTube. They bought YouTube. Who did Facebook buy? Instagram. Why did they both buy well-established, they could have created their own, yet they bought well-established video social media. Why did they do that? Data. Because the future is video. All they're doing is looking at what are the eyeballs going to, and the eyeballs on the internet on, in, on everything are going to video. Is that true? And now we have some big tech changes What's the big tech change about this thing? It's out right now. It's very expensive, but it is out. No, no, no. The foldable screen. The foldable screen. It's out. It's expensive, and it's not perfected, so they're having some technical problems. Samsung through their foldable screen, but the screen is going to be double this size. But the size in your pocket ain't going to change because it's going to be foldable. Now, why are they doing that? For video. For document reading, second, but video first. And what else is playing into that really importantly right now? Why did they do right now the foldable screen? They actually got it out there before the science was perfected, the engineering was perfected. They went ahead and got it out there. Why? What's happening? 5G. 5G. What's 5G compared to 4G? <laughs> not, no, it's not a thousand. Uh, 5G has a, an incredible opportunity to be a hundred or more times faster, but due to bandwidth load, when people start using it a lot, it won't. But it will be routinely eight times faster than four. Eight times faster. Is that significant? That's never drop a video, crystal clear clarity, everything really perfect. So along comes the foldable screen. We got 5G going. What does this mean for you? You better be doing video. I'm not kidding. You've got to be doing video because if you don't have video, the number one search engine, Google, Google is going to reward real estate searches. Where am I again? Mama? No, Mama. <laughs> People are going to Google and typing real estate New Jersey. How's that? That's easy. Real estate New Jersey, enter. And sites that have video are going to rise in priority. And if they're on YouTube, rise to even higher priority over sites that don't have video. Is that true? Oh, you can make a book on that. And what's the second largest search engine? YouTube's number one. Who's number two? Amazon. Yeah. Nope. No. Nope. Safari. No. YouTube. YouTube is the second largest search engine behind Google. Behind Google. That literally means people are typing on YouTube, real estate in New Jersey, enter. And they don't want to read a bunch of text. They want to see pictures, video. They want to see information, property views, tours down the street, looking at communities. That's what they're looking for. Is that true? That's what they're looking for. We, we have an agent who built his sales career out of doing nothing but video. Uh, in the Jacksonville market in North St. John's County, we have a tremendous amount of new construction right now, a lot of growth and development. 
and he simply started going to every single development project and shooting a video standing out in front of the entrance sign. And this is when maybe the, the main drive wasn't even paved yet. He said, this is our newest subdivision starting up, Copperhead Creek, and blah, blah, blah. And then he would walk you into the neighborhood when it was built out and introduce you to some of the builders. Here's Bob Johnson, Bob's building 47 houses here. Bob tells something to the folks here. And Bob's here, brum, 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 brum. He was prepped for this. Now we're gonna go in and take a look at some of Bob's houses. So he started doing these videos about area, subdivisions, the schools, the shopping, the nightlife, and then videos about each individual builder and what they're offering. No other lead gen at all, these videos, 127 sales. Just off the videos. Just off the videos. Now, if you, if you don't hear that and realize you've got to get videos going, you're just, you're going to get left. I'm just telling you, you're going to get left. So, uh, this is the way it works. Uh, if you had multiple sites, I'd drive that, but realize the goal of the online marketing, both social and static media, and social media is to get them to your website, and that would be the command consumer site. Uh, command is all set up to do quick pay-per-click campaigns on Facebook. It's all set up, it's done, there's no middleman on the marketing, it'll be the cheapest Facebook advertising you can do, and it's that utility is done. It's ready to go, you just click, 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 set your ad dollar, $20 a week, enter, boom, done. That's very exciting. LinkedIn, 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 LinkedIn. Should we talk about Facebook? Yeah, just for one minute. Um, Facebook. Facebook has 2.1 billion users. On a daily basis though, there's more eyeballs going to Google than on Facebook. And there's more time being spent on Google searches and results than on Facebook. But there's still way more people people on Google than any other social media platform, way more, right? So you can have a business fan page and you can have a personal page. Now what do we know about that? If you're a real estate agent, what do we know about that? The agents who work both very heavily, and I have agents that farm their neighborhood with Facebook. So I got people playing a lot around Facebook, but the people that have a Facebook business fan page and have a personal page and work both equally hard get more business off the personal page than the business fan page because it's called social media. And people want to go see your tuna sandwich. They don't want to see your business stuff. Is that true? Mm -hmm. That's true. So what's the convention for that? You have to follow the convention. It is social media. The convention is you need to make four or five social posts before you do a business post, right? but you should also do the business post in a very atypical manner. So don't put up a picture and say, see my new listing on your personal page. That's just not good. So what you should do is take the most drop dead picture of the new listing, like the kitchen or the backyard, and say, wow, what a kitchen. See more pictures, click here. You don't need to say, see my new listing. Does that make sense? And if they click to see you know, more pictures of the kitchen, where's it going to go? To the website. And then you're going to be making other offerings because that should be a frame and you're going to be, yeah, you get it. Okay. Uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is almost surprisingly very steadily growing as both a lead gen tool and as a tool to find hires if you have a team. I talked to somebody just yesterday who made a great hire uh, for their admin and an agent hire all off posting ads on LinkedIn. So apparently there's some serious job shoppers uh, increasingly looking on LinkedIn. If you're going to use it for a lead gen, you're going to need to build a family, a network, kind of like a BNI group, get your CPA, your accountants, your lawyers, your banker, all those people in a network. You're going to need to post an article about what you do and encourage your people to post an article about what they do. So once a week, everybody's posting one article, and now that community becomes a source of information about real estate and the issues all around real estate, from remodeling to building to funding to financing to inspecting, etc. Everybody get that? Yep. And those people will be bringing their spirit. We already talked about turn WordPress into a, uh, yeah. 
All of it? Uh, it can be your own BNI group. If you know what a BNI, a business network, internet, yeah. So get all of your affiliates to agree to go together on LinkedIn and create a community that is searchable. But they'll be bringing all of their database to it as well. So you have a really large community where people can be looking at your articles about the real estate market. But because they're your network, there's no other realtor in this network. You all follow that? Yes. Okay. Lead generate with Twitter? I hate Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> All right, aggregators and disintermediaries. This is, we've already talked about this. Uh, the aggregators, kw.com is an aggregator. Realtor.com was built to be an aggregator and then due to duplicitous dealing became a disintermediary, which we talked about earlier. Um, if you don't know the history of this, the three people that did that deal went to prison because that deal where we lost control of Realtor.com was done duplicitously. And I didn't say illegally, I said duplicitously, meaning they lied to the people at NAR's board of directors who were making a decision about what to do. They lied to them about it, but their right, their authority to sign the documents that turned it over was entirely legal. Don't get that? So they were charged with duplicitous behavior. They lied to the people who, who did the deal. And that's why the deal can't be undone. It was a legal deal, although they were lied to, the people that signed the deal. And three people went to prison. It's the dark underbelly of NAR's history, where we lost control of our trade name on the internet. It's just uglier than ugly. And that literally spawned Realtor.com into a disintermediary who created Trulia, who created Zillow, who created everybody that is buying the feed and then grabbing eyeballs and selling them back to us. It all came from those three people who did the dirty deal, right? And we are about, think about this, we're about to take back control of that pipe, at least for us. Is that big? That's really big. That's really big. We're undoing a long, if you wonder why Gary's doing this, he's been mad about it ever since it happened. <laughs> So, we are a tech company. We are a tech company, no question about it. Oh, I meant to back up. Do you have any questions about these? Boomtown Tiger Leads Commission Inks provide you turnkey solutions for internet lead generation. So, they're not a disintermediary. They give you a platform that you lease, you pay a flat fee, it's tied to a CRM, and they're very good, they're very good. Boomtown is what a lot of people in our company have used to build their uh, uh, expansion locations. Uh, ben Kenny, um, uh, Tim Heil, there's a bunch of people. Uh, uh, Wendy Papazan, there are a lot of people that are using Boomtown to do that. And they're using the CRM as well because it's a really good CRM. There's a flat fee you pay for the platform and then you pay on top of that ad dollars. And the flat fee depends on how many users, but it'll cost you somewhere around five, six hundred dollars a month up to two or three thousand a month if you have a large team. And then you'll pay the ad dollars on top of that. The typical user is spending thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year for the tools. And if you and if you're listening, Lance Loken and Ben and all these people are saying point blank, we're gonna have to get pull the plug on all of that. Because of what Gary is creating. It's just unbelievable. We will have the state of the art stuff. Websites, video platforms, everything. Just state of the art. So, and by the way, these people are not bad people. Boomtown, if you saw it, maybe, created a cloud agreement with KW. So there are people like me and like Ben that have a choice. They can keep their Boomtown websites running, but because of that agreement, all the visitors to the site are gonna flow straight into command instead of flowing into Boomtown CRM and then you'd have to export them into command. Now, if you're doing high volume internet traffic, that's a big deal. Y'all follow that? And that's why they're doing that. Um, all right, so yeah, we are a tech company. This is our stuff. If you're not getting into the game with everything here, you, you are gonna be behind. Okay. Building your database, circle prospect. And who's the person that asked about? It? There you go. Well, here it is. I told you it was coming. Circle prospect. 
Server prospecting ideally is mail call C. It's the simple reality of if you have a listing in a neighborhood, there are neighbors around there, and if you do the analytics and find out what the turnover rate, you can literally calculate how many people do I need to door knock before I'm probably talking to the next seller. So if the turnover rate is 3%, then if you knock on 35 doors, you've talked to one seller. If you do 100, you've talked to three sellers. And if you talk to them constantly during the selling process, and you get it up for sale, and then a week later you do an open house, and when you put it up for sale, you door knock them. And then the next week you do an open house, and you come out midweek and invite them to the open house. And then three weeks later, you have a contract on it, and whatever you all do, you put a pending on it or you know whatever, uh, and then you door knock them and announce we have a contract on this property that's fully executed. And then you go around again when you take the sign down. If you do that four times, you will list the neighbors. You will list the neighbors. Because when the neighbors watch somebody do it and work that hard that they go and work the neighborhood door to door, there will not have been any agent who's ever done that. And watching your work ethic and watching you succeed, and if you're fun to talk to at the front door, if you connect with them, you're gonna get the business. Is it that simple? Yeah, but I just described a lot of work. Is that true? The people who work will be anybody who won't work as hard as they work. You believe that? I'm just telling you, that's flat out the truth. Uh, we've done a lot of this, and this works. Circle prospecting works. You don't have to be farming to circle prospect. If you have a listing and you sell it to the neighborhood you want more business, you don't have to start farming it. Circle prospect. Circle prospect. Yep, that's Well, the difference is you're sending out mass marketing to everybody constantly, and you're trying to door knock everybody. This is, I'm going to work 100 people around one door. And if I get nothing, I'm not coming back. Right? If I get some, then that one's like two blocks over because it was in the hundred I knocked. Now I'm going to do a hundred around that and now I'm talking to different neighbors. And some of them are the same neighbors I talked to around the first. Y'all follow that? Okay. All right. Um, again, the best, best, best strategy is to be mailing them, knock, door knocking them, and then calling them. That is the best strategy. Any questions about this? Circle prospect? No? Y'all are easy. Are you getting full? Yes, yes sir. Uh, when you're door knocking, do you bring any um, marketing material or supplier? When you're circle prospecting, do you bring anything? Absolutely. What I described, I'll go into detail with what I described. When you take a listing, and it's really important you do it exactly in this order, really important, because it has maximum return on investment of your time. You went and listed the property yesterday. You went out today and put the sign up. The people coming home tonight are gonna to see the sign for the first time. Not the seller, but all the neighbors, right? They're gonna be driving by seeing the sign for the first time. You with me? If they're, if they're in any way gonna be next, if they're thinking about selling, then when they pull into their driveway five houses over, what do they wanna do? See if they can pull it up and find out how much it is. Right? Now, it's often too early. It hasn't uploaded to the web. Y'all follow that? Okay, because you just put it in the system today, and sometimes it takes 48 hours before it populates on the web, right? Particularly to Zillow. So you want to door knock that night. It has to be that night. The sign goes up. You want to take 10 flyers. So you want to make a little photo melange on one sheet of paper and it's got like five or six photos of the property inside backyard. You got bullet points, four or five bullet points, bedroom, bath count, square footage, if that matters in your market, any special features uh, and the price and your contact information. Then on the back, you understand I'm describing a one page eight and a half 11 flyer. On the back, you need big letters, four URLs, big letters. Thinking about selling, go to this website. Thinking about buying, go to this website. Thinking about relocation, go to this website. Thinking about real estate investing, go to this website. Those four websites, URLs, with your KW uh, consumer site can just be URLs that go to landing pages on your quote mother site, right? 
in, in theory, your mother site contains the 500 individual consumer sites that all these users are using, but they're just outgrowths of your big sticky core site that you're building through use, right? So they're gonna they're gonna get this flyer. So you're gonna door knock. You ready? Go at dinner time, 6:30, 7 o'clock. You can do a hundred in one hour because about 40 percent won't be home. You follow me? So if I'm walking there, if it's dark and the house is dark, I'm not even going up to the door, right? But if it looks like people are home, I'm definitely going to the door. Hi, good evening, I'm Gene Rivers, co owner Realty, the Rivers team, neighborhood real estate experts. Guess what, did you see the sign? The Smiths are selling, can you believe it? They told me their kids play with your kids, they're gonna miss seeing your kids, but they're moving. Congratulations, they got a job promo and they're, they're excited about it. Here's a fact for you, 14% of buyers, 1-4% have a friend, relative, or coworker that live in the neighborhood they buy in. Do you understand what I'm saying to you, sir? You could pick your new neighbors. So I brought you 10 flyers, you need to hand them out to friends, coworkers, Anybody you think might be a candidate to be your neighbor, hand them out. They've been in your backyard. They said, I love this neighbor. You have a beautiful home. That person needs this flyer. So you hand those flyers out. You'll be helping the Smiths, and you'll be helping yourself because you can pick your neighbor. If you have questions about real estate, selling, buying, relocating, or investing, turn over the back. You have those four websites just for you. You go there, and you have an experience like you've never had on the Internet looking at real estate. My name is Gene Rivers. I'm the neighborhood real estate expert. Help Smiths, help yourself. See you later. Bye. Do you actually get that that's, much That's out? the script, huh? Do you actually get, that's a long script. Do you actually get that much out before they <laughs> my, oh no, my goal is, is they're going to be standing there with a the dinner napkin and they have food in their mouth. <laughs> so they just keep shut. And I, and I literally, you hit an important point. I'm talking fast because I want to get it out and leave. Now, there's a, there's a behavioral issue here, right? So if I say it, I'm turning it in. So, Gene Rivers, see you later, bye. And I'm leaving deliberately while I'm saying goodbye. Now, if they do the, just a minute. Yeah. Well, it's like rotary. There you go. There you go. I'm literally trying to smoke them out. Yes? Well, I'm just curious. About what? I know what's coming. I know about real estate in the neighborhood. How's it going? You know, that's a wonderful question. I'd love to talk to you about that. Unfortunately, i got to do all these doors because i got to get home to have dinner with my wife and my kids. I'm sure you can appreciate that. I'm sorry I interrupted your dinner. But I can come back tomorrow at 10 or 4 o'clock and discuss the real estate market in depth with you and take a quick tour of your home. Now, what I'm doing is in assumptive clothes, yeah. right? And they give you all the information you need to decide about selling. Well, I didn't say I was selling. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I misunderstand? And the people who are, guess what they say? No, tomorrow's not a good time. Got him. Well, what time will work for you? <laughs> you hear that? Now, a lot of them are just going to stand silent and say, okay, you know, boom, you're done. You just close the door, and I'm gone. Uh, I'm going to go back again when? You understand this is a system. Three days later. Three days later, because I know, I know when I door knocked them. But I, I'm going to do the open house. The best time to do any open house is the first week of the listing, the first weekend. That is the best time to do it, right? So I'm going to go back on Wednesday and maybe Tuesday, but I'm going to put up a, a writer on the yard sign that says open Sunday 2 to 5, and then I'm going to door knock that night when I do that. Whenever I put that up, I'm going to go door knock again. It's going to be the same flyer, only now there's a banner, open Sunday 2 to 5 with it, with the date. Yeah? Do you ever No, no, no. We've had not good experience. When your flyers are getting caught up in the wind and are flying around on the streets, you'll have a certain percentage of people that will call and complain that you're littering their neighborhood. One important issue is you always are trying to make friends, not a single enemy. I don't want a single enemy. I don't even care if I think it's irrational what they're saying. I'm just not there to offend anybody. Y'all get that? It's a very, very delicate thing. you got to be thoughtful about what you're doing. And realize this, the goal of door knocking is not flying. Right? If I wanted a flyer, I'd hire a college kid to do it for 10 bucks an hour. My time is worth way more than that. But my time spent doing this gives big buck returns to me. Y'all follow that? Because I'm literally trying to meet the neighbors. I have no interest in flyer, if that makes sense. 
So you go back again, you announce the open house. Hey, it's Gene Rivers, remember me? Sure you do. Listen, we're having the house on open house. All those people, I got more flyers with the date and the time and location. Please hand them out and tell them to come. By the way, didn't you ask me about how's the market? We didn't have time to connect. Why don't you come over and see me Sunday? I'll be over there two to five. Bring your family members, bring your friends. Someone you know may buy the Smiths and live right there. See you then, bye. I'm gonna go back again when I put up the under contract or pending. What do y'all put up? <laughs> under contract, so under contract. You go and knock. Hey, what's my name? <laughs> and I do that all the time. It's fun. They look at me and go, I know who you are. I know. You. What's my name? I see Rivers. Yeah, listen. Did you see the sign? It's under contract. Do you know? Is it a friend, brother, or co-worker? Was it somebody that you had to fly for the bottom? Do you know? Do you have any idea? Because I don't know. Do you have any idea? You don't? I'm sorry. Listen, here's, here's the deal. It's under contract, and we still have people contacting us who'd like to buy a home in this neighborhood. So would you like to sell your house? Now, that's the direct approach. If you're more of the indirect person, then you say, so I'm door knocking to find any neighbors who might want to sell their house. Are any of your neighbors considering selling? Do you know? I might have a buyer for them. That's the indirect approach, right? If you do the direct approach, you can do something you can't do with the indirect, which is you can elicit an emotional response. If they're, if they're potentially interested, but they don't want to tell the realtor, you can get it out of them through body temperature. In other words, if, you, if you're going to ask that, if you're going to do that, that assumptive close, so would you like to sell your house? This is the body language. You step closer to them and lean in. So would you like to sell your house? And if they start blinking a lot or stammering or flushing, yeah, it's them. They're ready. <laughs> no, because what's happening is, is I'm asking them real direct, and their initial response is, well, yeah. Right? And yet their, their brain grabs them and says, don't tell the realtor. Are you crazy? They'll hook you right then on the spot. Right? So they don't have an answer, and that's why they flush or stammer or start eye blink a lot. Those are all signs of deceit. So they're, they're hiding the truth from it. The people that aren't, my experience with this, the people that aren't selling at all, they're always the same thing. So it's like selling, I was going, no, not selling. It's calm, it's immediate, no issue, not selling. They all do the same thing. And then you know, no, nope, not this one. Does that make sense? Huh? If anybody who says, yeah, I'd like to talk to you now, say, that's wonderful. I can't. I've got to go you know, do these doors so I get home to my dinner. The setting of an appointment tomorrow or this week at a set time is a what? A qualifier. That is a lead qualifier. If they want me to come in now and talk about selling, but won't give me an appointment to come later to talk about selling, they want to hear what I have to say, but they've already got another realtor in mind. Y'all follow that? That's exactly what's going on. If they truly will consider me, they'll book a separate time for me to come back. That sign that they want to talk but not book a separate appointment is all you need to know to say, no, I don't want to, I don't want to meet with you now. And that's the only way you can get that out is to say, no, I can't do it right now. I'll do it later. Yes? Mr. Gene, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. I've been coming to your classes for years. Yes. You're preaching to the choir. Can I give a success story that might... Uh Please. Okay, so this is because and don't call me Mr. Gene. I'm old enough without the Mr. Gene. <laughs> <laughs> um, this works. And uh, I just came up here about six, eight months ago from the shore, what we call the shore down the shore. So everyone knows Avalon and Stone Harbor. Okay, so him and a couple other people were like, get out there and door knock. So I would take an hour during the summer, peak time, to start door knocking. So. Of course, you pick a nice neighborhood where people are going to be, you know, they're not, you know, at the beach or something, you want to make sure they're home. So, knocked on the doors, little old tear down on the bay, and I said, are you looking to, anything I can help you with? And I have my flyers, like Gene said, and uh, he says, yeah, we're looking to sell the house. I'm like, oh, okay, he said, come on in. And I'm like, come on in. <laughs> so, and I, so I went in and I sat down, and within a couple of hours, I had a listing contract, and it was for... 3.1 million or 3.2 million on the water was a teardown. And I put the sign up, I think the next day, the next day the neighbor called and said, I've been looking at this house, I want to buy it. They put the offer in, I got both sides of the deal. That was a life-changing check for me, that was a 6.2 or 6.4 aggregate sale. 
So fast forward to last year, because in the same neighborhood, in the same couple of blocks, I did what Gene said. It was just a couple of blocks in the south end of Avalon that I would concentrate on. And so they knew me. So the one guy says, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not interested. Either, but, but keep in touch. So I kept in touch with them. And, you know, on the tickler, every three times a year, just give them a call. Hey, it's Larry. Oh, it's, it's nice, nice to hear you. How you doing? Found is good, whatever, whatever. Next, next, next. Get your prospecting done. So I get a call from him in um, uh, the spring or the winter of uh, the winter, this past winter. And he says, Larry, I'm on my boat and I passed that blue house on 60th. What can you tell me about it? I'm like, oh, you know, doing as best I can, get on the information, put the offer in, and he bought it. 3.6. Then he says, I need to sell my house. 1.85. Sold. Larry, you know I mowed that lady's house, her lawn, the little lady next to her, I mowed her lawn, little tear down white house there? Sure. Sold that. 1.6. Little old lady needed to buy a condo, 600000 that's $10 million worth of business from door knocking. Wow. Thanks, Gene. Thank you. Thank you. Imagine that. You get in front of people and things happen. Imagine that. And if you don't like it, put some music on. Take a drink in a thermos. I don't, whatever gets you. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. The guy that literally was like, if he signed the contract, I knew, who knows Stone Harbor? Anybody? Stone Harbor? Well, you know Springers? He wanted that blueberry, whatever yeah. ice cream that they specialize in. Sure enough, I got my butt down to Springer's when he signed the contract and like, here's some ice cream for you. <laughs> so that that kept him top of mind to me. So yeah, anything. All right, we gotta move on. We're running behind now, but uh, it's all really good stuff. So door knocking, flyering, circle prospecting, uh, sign calls. Uh, answer the phone now. Answer the phone. Most agents don't answer their phone. If you want sign calls, you got to answer the phone. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. Uh, text messaging. Uh, offerings on the sign. In the country, most agents report over many years, sign calls have gone down. And the reason is very simple. People pull up, pull the, the phone up, and get all the info they need on the phone. Is that true? Yeah. So, uh, what is the sign offering? The house. So when they can find out about the house online, they don't need to talk to you. But can the sign offer something else? <laughs> yes, it can. And you would do this with writers that have text message offerings. So have them bought recently, free buying guide, text this number. New to town, relocation package, text this number. By the way, that one gets a lot of responses. Uh, new to town, relocation package, text this number. Inspection report, list of vendors. I could go on and on. The people that are doing this well are playing with lots of different kinds of messaging, and you, sh you would be surprised what gets responses. Uh, top 10 favorite restaurants, text this number. That gets a lot of responses. Yes? <laughs> no, on the yard sign. So it's a writer that's just a text sign writer, right? It's all about text, this text number. So there are a lot of people getting leads off of text writers. So I would I would try that. Um, yeah. Open houses. Uh, we can talk a lot about these. Uh, last year and the year before and the year before and the year before, somewhere around 50 to 65 percent of people who bought a house, the ZNAR's numbers, visited an open house. At least one. So it's half or more, up to about two-thirds of people who buy houses visit an open house. Is that an important thing to know? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. What, is it, what does that mean to you when I say that? Yeah, uh, yeah a simple mindset ought to be, it ought to be kind of motored into your solar system that you do an open house the first weekend of the listing. Uh, it, it would be only a listing that I don't want leads off of that listing that I would not do that. And, I, and I'm not making a joke about that. We get referrals. Do you get referrals? We get referrals for stuff that's way below my team average price. Do y'all get that? We're going to take it and we're going to sell it. I don't want any of the buyers off of that. I, I don't want any of them because my agents will be dumbing down their income. Y'all follow that? And I got enough leads at a higher price, buyer leads, that I don't need to say you got to do this every single one, right? So 
I would be paying attention to that issue. Uh, but yeah, there's a there's a price point where I actually lose money if we sell something. I lose money because of having the team size. Uh, so the open houses, number one, signage plus, lots of directional arrows. I'm sure you have sign police issues, but if you can do them, the more you put up, the, the better. Tallahassee, our sign police, you can put your arrows up at 5 p.m. on Friday, and they have to be down by 8 a.m. on Monday, or they will seize them all and fine you. So it's a serious deal, but it's a good enough time. We like to put up 25 or 30 directional arrows. Uh, our goal is to get at least 15 people to the open house, and directional arrows are a cheap and easy way to drive traffic. We get people that are going, they're looking for a different house that end up at our house because of all the directional arrows. They get lost on the arrows. <laughs> uh, you need to make offerings. Uh, new agents, I don't want to alarm you, but the majority of people who come to the